Okay, Mr. Mayor, we are now recording and streaming to YouTube. All right. I would like to call to order this committee of the whole. Uh, would the acting city manager please call the roll? Yes. Mr. Green? Here. Mr. Leroy? Here. Mr. O'Reilly? Mr. O'Reilly? Here. Thank you. Uh, Miss Everett? Here. Miss Stancorp Taylor? Here. Mr. Delgado? Mr. Delgado? Here. <laughs> and Mayor Hoffmeister? Here. All right, the first order of our business, we have a presentation by WCIA. I will turn it over to them so they can present their slides. <laughs> All right, Scott, uh, we'll hand it over to you and you can introduce your group and then I will go through the slides for you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for um, hosting us today. Uh, Mayor and council members, appreciate the time to uh, share with you some of our findings and recommendations uh, as we think about uh, the hiring in the city uh, organization. Um, I represent the WCIA and we have a research sub team. Um, we have two other folks that really contributed to this um, report we're gonna share with you today, um, both uh, Rhonda Evans as well as um, Cindy Calicott. And so I'll just be speaking today uh, to uh, convey what we found and what we think might be valuable for the city to consider as they uh, look to diversify their employees. So Rusty, can you advance the slide? So what we're gonna talk about today real quickly um, as a quick overview is a, a slide or two talking about the diversity, um, the benefits for diversity in the employee base, as well as the challenges of achieving a diverse workforce um, with some references to uh, both business uh, as well as um, uh, organizations that uh, support local governments, um, city, state, uh, federal government organizations. We're gonna look at um, and rec recommend some best practices for improving diversity in city hiring. So we have some 14 ideas uh, that we hope the city would consider uh, moving forward. We do have some examples uh, from other cities uh, that we can use as kind of role models for uh, growth in this area. And we're also providing a list of associations and websites that we think are going to be valuable for the city as, uh, again, as we move forward in, in hiring um, uh, open slots. Next slide, please. So if we, if we look at why we care about diversity, a lot of different reasons, of course, um, as we uh, think about um, uh, the maturity uh, of this topic uh, in organizations, you know, from the civil rights era through today. Um, more recently though, um, many organizations are looking at why and how uh, diverse leadership really influences the performance of an organization and have shown some strong results um, in terms of capturing uh, benefits, both at an individual level. You know, and when you have diverse leadership, people are more likely to uh, expend more dis discretionary effort. They have longer tenure lengths with an organization as they see diverse leadership. Um, organizations as a whole have financial benefits um, you know, kind of outstrip their competitors when they have diverse leadership. And we also know uh, from research that you know, there's increased collaboration among teams when uh, people see diverse leadership and setting that as a priority for how we interact uh, as uh, people in an organization. And so there really is um, some key outcomes um, that are really important to organizations in their long-term success when we have diverse leadership and diverse membership. Next slide, please. We also know, however, that uh, establishing and, and building a diverse organization is very hard. Uh, and we have a lot of hurdles um, in order to build out that capability and that representation. Uh, we're concerned a lot about um, 
how implicit biases and just the culture of organizations can uh, influence and inadvertently, in many cases, influence uh, the, um, the recruitment process and, create, and, and make it difficult the hiring of uh, diverse candidates. Um, we know from some, some studies that even something as somewhat innocuous as the names on resumes can really influence uh, whether um, applicants are called back. Um, we know from similar research that uh, when we have black sounding names on those resumes, it actually uh, presents a hurdle um, and that uh, even considering their years of experience, uh, they get uh, downgraded in terms of those evaluations and the desire for, for um, hiring those uh, candidates uh, in later end stages in the, in the process. We also know from experiments that when uh, those types of signals, um, in this case, in the last example here, we have uh, examples from even orchestra um, tryouts where um, female candidates uh, performed much more, uh, uh, were accepted at much higher rates when um, screens were placed so that uh, those um, candidates uh, weren't visible to the folks that were listening and uh, extending offers to advance to the next stages of the um, tryouts. And so we do think that uh, implicit bias can influence uh, the hiring process and we should establish practices in the recruiting um, that help address some of those concerns. Next slide, please. And so as we were reviewing uh, these references uh, by thought leaders, by organizations, by uh, governmental groups, uh, we really uh, think that there are some 14 uh, best practices that we can adopt here in Wyoming. We've uh, oriented them into four buckets, really having to do with advertising and recruiting, uh, the job posting process and materials, stages around reviewing resumes and interviewing, and also the record keeping uh, of this activity to help with, um, again, building a diverse slate. Okay, can we advance please? So in terms of advertising, <clears throat> We have four ideas that we think are gonna be valuable. And I should say uh, before we get into um, these ideas that we're recommending these in some respects um, a bit blind because we don't have an in-depth review of uh, the actual practices within the Wyoming uh, city organization. And so some of these may already be um, in place and very robust. Others may have only just started. Others may have, uh, are maybe completely new. Um, and others, in fact, may have been tried before and have been set aside as not being that valuable. So what we're trying to do um, as WCIA is build a relationship, build a kind of collaboration in these areas so we can find out what works, what might be um, uh, amenable uh, in the short term, might take longer to get to, et cetera. So this isn't based on any sort of review or a full assessment of the practices uh, within the city. Scott, uh, Scott can, I, can I speak up real quick? So I, did, I didn't, I should have said at the beginning that, um, so the WCI and I have already been talking about many of the things you're gonna see in this presentation today. And Scott really has put together a great presentation here uh, we work closely already. We've had conversations about how um, some of these recommendations could help. Um, so, you know, we have an understanding right now, and I, I think we're in a good place. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Thanks, Scott. Okay. Thank you. So we think that, uh, first off, um, the presence on the web is very important. And you will notice that there are several um, instances where we talk about web resources and broadening uh, the reach and scope um, of, of the job postings and uh, using uh, the media landscape that's quite different from uh, even the past handful of years. Uh, starting with our own websites, um, we think really should have a much more uh, diverse uh, feel uh, and imagery on the website and different publications. I think that's just a, a matter of uh, uh, putting our best um, face forward uh, in terms of portraying this community uh, and how diverse it really is. 
Um, and so looking thoroughly at uh, wyomingohio.gov, what's up Wyoming, Recreation Times, Facebook, Twitter, Nextdoor, all those social media properties uh, we think would be uh, very helpful. Um, we do think it's important and as research has shown that EEO policy statements, diversity statements, you know, on websites, references within job postings that point to uh, those statements are very helpful to convey an openness to, uh, of, uh, of the city to applicants of a diverse background. And so uh, updating it, having it be more prominent, um, the language that's inviting um, would be and less legalistic, um, I think would be a very useful step in terms of, again, the surround for all of these job postings that uh, may happen over the years. We do think it's important to, to look at uh, job boards that have uh, diverse users um, and to think very broadly about where we might uh, you know, post these um, uh, these jobs that are being hired in. You know, we can route, reach out to millions of candidates um, who aren't aware of, uh, you know, wyomingohio.gov page. Um, and so we think that um, uh, there's lots of opportunities to broaden the reach uh, for these postings. And lots of people are, um, you know, considering uh, jobs from a, a, a broad a geographic um, area. And we also have identified in these later slides, um, these professional associations, many of which have a job posting features uh, to their um, membership. And so again, there's diverse members that we can reach that perhaps we haven't in the past. The last item on this um, uh, list has to do with uh, the very useful notions around um, professional networks and referrals. Um, research has shown that it's uh, very useful to, to speed up uh, the hiring process. Um, in terms of finding candidates, in terms of building uh, those relationships with other uh, kind of, uh, again, using those networks uh, to build a, a pipeline of candidates. And so uh, there is an opportunity. I think the caution with this one would be uh, to what extent is that um, uh, become somewhat of a, lim a kind of a privileged uh, type of process too. So again, with the intent of broadening it to uh, candidates of a diverse nature, it might be a very worthwhile to consider how to, to build a, a referral campaign. Now, in terms of job postings. Uh, excuse me, I think one of the council members has a question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I didn't know if I had to hold it till the end. Hey, Scott, great presentation. I have a question on what you were just talking about. And it's in this context. We we tried to recruit diverse applicants for the police force several years. We worked with Cincinnati PDs. Um, uh, I would call them affinity groups, but they were representative of people of color and uh, people with diverse backgrounds. We worked with uh, neighboring communities. We did a lot of this outreach and, and we still had a challenge. And so I'm wondering if you have any experience working in law enforcement recruiting in particular, or is this kind of transcending all, all dimensions of employment? Thanks. Yeah, I don't think we have anything that is particular to law enforcement or safety services uh, recruiting. Um, I think that those are you know, great practices. I don't know what, um, uh, you know, that you mentioned, uh, Mr. Leroy, that, uh, that you adopted. I think those are, uh, you know, going to be important to do um, despite uh, you know, perhaps not um, seeing the fruits of that. I think that is, a, uh, you know, what you would want to do, um, you know, regardless. Um, I'm not sure if there's, uh, you know, I think that there's another kind of source of, of um, uh, concern, if you will, that many of these are not in itself a silver bullet. Um, and so uh, we may still have difficulties um, uh, identifying diverse candidates who want to come work uh, you know, for the city. Um, so I think that there is uh, just a, a need to continue to do the, those activities um, and build those relationships. And uh, over time, those, uh, th those candidates will come. Okay, thank you. So in terms of job postings, we do think it's important to have, um, uh, you know, to watch out for uh, language and, uh, uh, and, and contributions in a way that we can pull in applicants who might not otherwise not have, you know, submitted the resume, 
uh, and filled out the applications. And so uh, we think it's very valuable to have a, a diversity panel of some sort to have input on these search documents and the process. They can really contribute some diverse perspectives on the languages and the resources used for the outreach. Uh, they can also provide some resume reviews in terms of hiring or in terms of reviewing uh, the applicants that come in. We do think that um, oftentimes the documents that are used for communicating these jobs um, can get confusing for applicants. And maybe that's not the right word, not confusing, but less um, uh, beneficial. I think there's um, a set of documents that are also internal facing, job descriptions, uh, job evaluation documents that are good documents to help guide uh, roles and responsibilities, guide uh, pay and benefits decisions, roles and responsibilities. However, uh, what we're learning is that in order to sell the job, those are different documents. Those are uh, that use more upbeat language without jargon, you know, uh, shorten them, cutting down to essentials really um, opens up the uh, the applicant pool uh, to people who wouldn't otherwise apply. Uh, less intimidating, less overwhelming for applicants to be considered. We wanted to, to also make sure we have language that, uh, that reflects some openness to a variety of experiences um, and to, to think about you know, subtle ways uh, that uh, we may be making and putting up barriers in front of applicants uh, that have kind of non-traditional experiences that would still be valuable in the roles that we're hiring for. And so uh, there is some uh, concern around quoted language that we have to watch out for. Um, and also think about this next one that has to do with, you know, acceptable minimal qualifications rather than what we might sometimes write in job descriptions and job postings that really portray more of a, what an ideal candidate would be, or might be an exceptional candidate might be. And so what we find in research there has to do with uh, whether people think they're close enough to be considered. And so if we have language that is, you know, um, exceptional language, uh, then unless they think of themselves as a real star, they're not going to submit, even though they would be a good candidate to, for consideration. And so we see this as a, as a, uh, a, a big finding, um, in, actually, in terms of you know, some gender-based differences in applications. Um, so um, something to consider that we make sure we have uh, you know, the qualifications that are in the postings reflect what really is necessary uh, for the job performance and not the an exceptional candidate. Uh, Scott, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, could you give an example of how to, like what sort of non-traditional sources of, of experience you would be talking about? So uh, uh, an, an, an unpaid internship is something only so many people can do. Like what, what other types of experience would broaden a description? Our description? Well, um, it probably would have to do with um, the job that we're hiring for, um, but, you know, we may have some you know, examples, and I'll just use from, you know, uh, you know, from experiences in HR, you know, we have some HR certifications uh, that might be really desirable for uh, an HR manager that works for the city. Um, you know, there's a, uh, you know, from uh, Society of Human Resource Management has certifications um, and so we may have that as something we would like to see, but we would we would discourage using that as a um, as a you know qualification to be considered for uh, an opening. Um, you know, we would also um, you know think about I think it, it, you would bring up a good example. You know, HR I'm sorry, non uh, you know, internships that perhaps are unpaid uh, would be an example. Um, even thinking about um, how. Um, you know, management roles from other uh, companies or in other functions may still apply to um, the jobs that we're hiring for. Thank you. Great, Scott, I had a quick question real quick on point number five. With that uh, diversity panel that helps with the resume writing and the candidate interviews, would that same panel stay with that candidate? Should they be appointed to that position to get that extra help? You mean once they come in and work for the city? Right. So if someone needs help with a resume or help understanding and navigating how to apply for a job and they get extra help for that, um, would that committee still mm -hmm. continue to help them 
and get them that assistance once they did get that job, if they did get that job? Well, I think that uh, you're talking about the support for uh, diverse candidates as they come on board to the city is an important uh, aspect for retention. I mean, it would, it's very important, I think, to, to think about the supporting environment for um, you know, people of, of color, diverse backgrounds, you know, so that we don't lose them in a handful of years, right? And so we're, you know, we're not making a ton, a ton of progress over the longer period of time. And so I think that you know, figuring out how to support those, uh, uh, those employees now uh, to stay with Wyoming is an important aspect that um, you really should be considered and it's its own set of challenges. Great, thanks for clarifying that, thank you. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I speak up? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, this is Rhonda Evans. Um, Zach, I think you all, I think just to be clear, the diversity panel that we're speaking of would be in order in it actually working with HR to get the candidates in. I think what you're talking about is once the candidate gets in there, that would be another HR pro program. That's not necessarily the purpose of the diversity panel. That's just to help bring in diverse candidates because that's those are two different things really. Thank you, but I, I thought I heard him say that that would help with resume writing and help navigate that process. And I just wanna make sure if we're giving that extra help to them to get the job that we continue to stay and support them with that extra help should they be awarded that position. Yeah, so let's, uh, let me clarify a little bit here too, um, Zachary, the, um, this panel would, uh, we wouldn't be, or I wouldn't envision this panel, you know, helping candidates work on the resumes for them to be, you know, considered, you know, for a certain job. Um, I think that would be kind of outside the, um, the role for that diversity panel. Um, but once the resumes come in, uh, they could help evaluate the resumes, you know, as, a, as an adjunct to the HR department. Um, they would also be part of maybe a review group that helps um, proof and make suggestions on, the job postings and where they're posted and what sort of advertising uh, is necessary to get the word out about those posts. So Scott, this is Chad, I have a question. What exactly is the weight of this, uh, I guess, added council to be? So let's say the council decides that they would like to look at a couple of candidates and one has come on, come in on their own and you have found one. And what's, what's your weight on that decision? Chad, Chad, this is, uh, we're not open for public comment quite yet. Oh, so sorry. Um, let's let uh, council can ask questions at this point. And then if uh, we're gonna allow public participation that will be up to the mayor to decide that later. So let's let uh, council continue with their questions at this point. Thanks Chad. I just have a quick comment. We're just listening to a presentation. We're not, um, I would just like to hear the presenters present. This is, there's no decision being made on any of this by council tonight. Um, and I, I don't know that we need to drill down into demanding how we would do any of these things at this point. Yeah, this is just, this is just recommendation from the WCIA. So we can, we can let him, Scott, uh, continue. Thanks, Rusty. All right, let's go to the next slide, if you would. Now, reviewing resumes is an important stage of the process for, uh, for hiring and, and selecting uh, you know, candidates to kind of advance through different evaluation stages and bring them on board. Um, one of the lessons that, that uh, this research has pointed out is uh, the value of at least in early stages to blind the resumes uh, before reviewing and distributing to search, the search committee. Um, and so we think about uh, redacting names uh, maybe even some home addresses and other information, which might be, uh, you know, some influence on the evaluations of the candidates at the early stages would really help uh, offer an opportunity for a more balanced consideration of, you know, job related experiences uh, and skills. We think it's important to, of course, have some uh, training uh, to avoid unconscious bias among the search committee members. That's becoming a standard part of uh, hiring teams, you know, around, um, uh, the country here. Um, an important part that's really, I think, is a, a, should be an established part, but just to reinforce 
you know, in the interviewing process, we do know that there are some companies and organizations who use much more unstructured interviewing process where it's a very, um, uh, you know, casual conversations. We think that's much more important to have a, a structured interviewing guide and criteria for evaluating these candidates. You know, unstructured conversations uh, can be uh, really are shown as being poor tools for hiring and can really allow bias to kind of infiltrate the process. Uh, we do think it's important to set some expectations around um, having a diverse slate of candidates. There's often a pressure to fill slots very quickly. And when you're reaching out to organization, to a kind of diverse and, and kind of non-traditional um, uh, conduits to these candidates, um, sometimes it takes a little longer. And so we have to have a little more patience and some, uh, you know, some expectation for inclusion. Uh, so we do have to watch out, you know, of course, for, for tokenism. Um, that would be kind of detrimental to this overall process, but we think that it's worthwhile to uh, consider, um, to formally expect some diverse candidates for the hiring that we do do. A couple of points, uh, recommendations around record keeping. We really do need to have um, some kind of evidence of transparency for uh, even in terms of these applicant searches or these recruitment searches, but also the diversity of the current city employees. I think that lends transparency, gives uh, opportunities for communicating uh, those investments and those learnings over time. Are we making progress? Uh, and we're identifying where the largest of, uh, pockets of opportunity within the city government. All right, let's go on to the next section. Um, and I know we're running out of time here for my uh, allotted moments or minutes here with you guys. And so I just wanted to call your attention to um, the next section where we're, we're identifying a handful of uh, uh, towns nearby has a similar makeup, oftentimes a similar story uh, to Wyoming. Of course, some differences, but we think are gonna be useful from a perspective of what sort of role models might be um, uh, accessible to us as we look at, you know, changing uh, how we approach hiring um, in the city of Wyoming. So Montgomery, uh, nearby town, a um, little bit larger or, uh, city, uh, but has adopted uh, many of these ideas in terms of uh, what's communicated on their website, what sort of resources they use to reach out to diverse candidates. If we go to the next slide, Rusty, just to give you some examples um, uh, of the types of work that they've been doing in their town. Um, you have staff training, establishing uh, groups, uh, incentive groups, interest groups uh, within uh, their town to uh, broaden the appeal. Uh, next slide, I think, has to do with um, uh, a town outside of Columbus. Bexley is a, a Columbus a suburb in many ways similar to uh, Wyoming, um, working on this since 2017 uh, and, and built into the this, this city's um, strategic plan. There's a couple in here. I don't want to spend a ton of time, I think, talking about those, but if, uh, for you folks to read um, later, um, let's spin a couple slides past. Yellow Springs also identified as a kind of a role model uh, town nearby. Um, and I think we have one more, Burlington, Vermont. Um, and then if we spin a little bit more down here, Rusty. Um, Cleveland Heights is a, a really good example. I think much larger town, 46,000 compared to with our um, 8,400 here, uh, a very diverse uh, uh, city already, uh, but they have done a really a fantastic job in my view, you know, portraying that diversity and welcoming uh, uh, aspects to people who are interested in working for Cleveland Heights. And so again, uh, as we look at what sort of face we put to the city, to uh, the, the folks on the web looking to uh, to come work uh, for the city uh, would be good to to look at them as a role model in that space. Last couple slides here, if we spend to those, are some resources, websites uh, uh, that would be. Um, if we go to the next one, it just as I think one more. Um, just as an example, where we have uh, identified associations and other resources that can be used by the city government. All right, so um, 
quick wrap up then, I guess. Uh, Rusty, did, do we have time now to talk about questions or is that something we do later in these meetings? Uh, we can talk about questions. I will just add that, um, again, these are just some recommendations from WCIA. Uh, we, uh, when Scott presented this to me, um, we had our presentation, <laughs> when Scott presented it to me, we, we talked for probably an hour and a half. Um, and we talked a lot about what Wyoming's doing, um, maybe how they could help us with certain things, some of their recommendations. So I, I feel like um, they, some of their recommendations are really good. Like I said, some of the stuff we're already doing, um, but they have uh, a lot of good recommendations here. So we've had a good conversation. I also presented the same um, slides to our uh, department heads uh, for them to consider as we look at hiring in the future. Um, currently we're not doing any hiring, but uh, actually I have already reached out to WCIA about the public works director position, just to get some information from them, um, some ideas from them. So. But any questions for Scott uh, from council? Questions from council? Yes. I've got a question, please. Okay, Mr. Riley. Okay. Um, I thought it was a very good presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I was the original commentator on the state of Ohio's collective bargaining law in 1984 and 85, taught uh, collective bargaining and labor relations for about 16 to 18 years at UC. And uh, my textbook went into several editions on public uh, bargaining in Ohio. So I'm very familiar as the state's first labor arbitrator with the complexities that go into building this kind of a system into an existing collective bargaining structure. Do you have a point of view of how we could adapt this technology or this uh, approach into our existing collective bargaining because we have a collective bargaining contract and we're not in a position to change that unilaterally without the union making a strong case for that being an unfair labor practice under the Ohio law. Do you have a point of view of what can be done for those employees who are in the collective bargaining situation? Well, you bring up a good point. I think that we uh, another area that we really did not do a full assessment of the current um, situation, you know, within the city government. So, uh, my understanding is that there are a, a couple of city government uh, contracts, uh, and you know, meshing some of these ideas with that would would require some due diligence for sure. Um, and so, um, we're hopeful that um, uh, there would not be. Um, you know, resistance or any kind of contrary uh, notions or rules associated with these requirements or these recommendations rather. So, but that would, uh, you know, stand to be reviewed. So I appreciate that. And it would be an important step before we get into uh, adopting these in, in broad scale. Thank you. Rusty, when you presented this, were you met with any sort of resistance or did people sort of see it as a common sense recruitment set of recruitment measures? That's, that's a good question, Sarah. I, I, it was met with, with positive feedback. I mean, uh, we initially, almost immediately, some of the department heads started talking about different things we could do right away. Um, some questions about things that we're already doing, but how could we enhance some of the things that we could do, especially when it comes to the job postings the advertising, um, you know, you know, and I've had this discussion with the WCI gr I group. Um, you know, we, we're not masters at marketing ourselves quite yet. So, uh, you know, when it comes to trying to get more information out there to show people what a wonderful place it is to come work in the city of Wyoming, uh, we need to get better at that and, and showing how diverse we can be, I think, you know, as department heads, we talked about that, and that was some of the things we um, latched onto right away. But it was met with uh, a lot of positive feedback, Sarah. Thank you. I, I appreciate hearing that, and that you shared it with the department heads. And just before my minutes up, thank you, Scott, Cindy, and Rhonda, for putting all this together because this is a lot of work. So thank you for bringing this to us. Nancy, go ahead. Um, 
so just a couple of things I would love to keep having conversations about this. Um, and maybe this is just something I should do personally with you, Rusty, but I'd love to hear what the city is already doing versus what can still be done. Um, but I, I do um, just want to thank Scott and Rhonda and Cindy. Yes. Because <laughs> um, I know these things are, are implicit bias. It's, it's such a difficult thing to, um, to tackle and figure out how to get around that. And um, but I think it's really important. I'm really impressed by um, Montgomery for what they've done. I had no idea, but um, I think our community community could do even better. <laughs> so um, thank you. Scott, I've got one, just one question. And um, again, a very good presentation and thank you all for the, for presenting this to us. And that is, um, Always, um, after a presentation, I always like to know what would be the training and or what kind of in-services and or um, educational opportunities would be for staff to be able to obviously widen their vision uh, in this area. And also council too. Uh, well, you know, there's a, a number of associations. Um, if we, I can't remember which direction we're at. Um, maybe go up. I think there is um, a number of uh, organizations that relate to uh, governmental organizations like the um, uh, ICMA, this first entry here, and even the International Public Management Association for HR. Um, a number of these um, actually uh, do have, you know, in-service um, webinars, seminars. Um, some of it was face-to-face. -face. Now much of it is online. Um, that uh, would be very topical uh, relative to uh, these concerns. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that there would be, you know, clearly um, if I look down Society for Human, Res Human Resource Management as an example uh, is very much attuned to um, uh, the training uh, opportunities and, and even offering training beyond those that are just uh, for human resource type uh, processes. So there's a number of resources uh, that would be very valuable for city management to, to look at. Yeah, I'll just pipe in, Al, that there was, we did do one training with council. I'm not sure if you were there when Lynn was still around. Um, I know Sarah and I were there and Rusty was there and some other, uh, John Boss, that we had a, a woman in town who does implicit bias training. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, if there are no further questions, we can move on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Very, very um, informative presentation. I learned. I learned. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. No Mayor. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there's no other further questions from the members of City Council, we can now move on to the second order of business, which is the rules of council. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Rusty, if, can you let me share my screen, or do you have the document I sent out? I can let you share your screen because. Okay, it's going to take me a minute to figure out which one of these screens it's on. So just bear with me. All right. Can everyone see the document? Yes. Well, the okay, perfect. Um, so <clears throat> as the city council may recall, um, we, back in the last fall, amended the rules of council. Um, and one of the changes that we made in doing this was um, to address a section of the code where um, that determined how procedural matters would be decided. And under the rules of council previously, 
um, the language stated that in the absence of a rule, the procedural matter would be determined by the chair. Um, and I think this was confusing and, and it lended itself to a lack of consistency uh, in how we handle things. So the change that was made in the fall was to change this language uh, to provide that uh, in the absence of a particular rule to govern that point of procedure, it would be governed by, the, by Robert's rules of procedure, parliamentary procedure. Um, so I thought it would be helpful just to do a basic review of motion practice under Robert's rules so that everyone has kind of a, uh, a starting point um, in this kind of little bit of a transition. And, and just from the outset, let me say that uh, Robert's rules could be an entire college course. Um, we're, we're barely going to scratch the surface here. Um, and I've kind of set forth, I think, what are the most important things for this particular body um, to be aware of when it deals with, uh, when we deal with motions. Um, but there is certainly a lot more information in Robert's rules. Um, but the, this is the information I think is most pertinent. And I'm gonna walk through this, um, this document that I have sent it to all of you also, so you have it um, and you can sort of use it as a cheat sheet. Um, I would also recommend just reviewing it and letting me know if you have questions about the content. Um, so, cause I'm not gonna read everything through here and, and bore everyone to death um, with that. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's just important to know that when we're dealing with motions and th these issues have come up in the past, how they need to be addressed. So first we have main motions and these are gonna be the motions that, are, that you use to conduct the business of the city. They're typically substantive, um, not procedural, and um, they, they are asking council to take some action um, or make some decision. Subsidiary motions are applied to pending motions. So these types of motions can affect the main motion that is being made. Um, there are also privileged motions that deal with particular points of privilege, and we'll review all of these in more detail. Um, there's incidental motions and then there's special motions. So let's look at these individually. Um, a subsidiary motion, there are several different items um, and they are ranked in order of which ones take precedent. So you have everything from tabling a motion, closing debate, limiting time or extending time for debate, postponing to a definite time, referring to a committee, amending the motion and postponing indefinitely. And the reason they're ranked is that a higher ranked motion will take precedence over a lower ranked motion in that respect. And, uh, and just to kind of go into a little bit of details, these are the ones that are, are most commonly cause confusion um, in doing the rules. And because uh, a lot of times there's confusion about tabling versus postponing um, in particular. So just to address those issues, if an item is tabled, it is taken off the agenda. It does not reappear until there is a motion to take it off the table. So it essentially lives in limbo until there is some action taken by council at a further date. Um, postponing, on the other hand, is typically what some, a lot of people mean to say when they make a motion to table something. When you postpone it to a definite date, it automatically gets put on the agenda at a later time, uh, depending on council's motion and when they want to take up the matter. If something is postponed indefinitely, it essentially dies, but it can be re-raised as a new motion at a later time. Um, so I just wanted to cover those items with you um, and if you see on these charts, um, <clears throat> I've kind of laid out um, whether or not the motion requires a second, whether or not the motion is something that can be debated, whether or not the motion is something that can be amended in the vote that's required to pass that motion. Um, when we talk about privilege motions, um, these, are, um, these are motions to adjourn, motions to take a recess, um, a motion, um, I'm sorry, to call for a point of privilege. 
Um, these are all considered privileged motions. They can be brought up at any time um, and they do take precedent. Um, it's, it's important to note on the point of personal privilege, um, typically uh, a member could use that item to raise any sort of issue that is causing them some sort of issue during the meeting, um, the room temperature, you know, people talking in the background, having side conversations, those types of things. However, under the rules of council, um, a point of personal privilege can only be made in cases where the council member's integrity, character, or motives are assailed, questioned, or impugned. So we really don't have, under our, rule, under our rules of council, a point of personal privilege that pertains to other things other than that, because the rules of council specifically exclude it. So like I mentioned at the beginning, Robert's rules is only going to apply when there is not a specific rule on point for an issue. Um, and you'll see I have a chart here for privileged motions, um, which ones require a second, which ones are debatable, which ones are amendable, and the vote required. I would just point out that um, a call for a point of privilege um, or to call for orders of the day, and, and orders of the day is just a term for saying we're not following the agenda, or we're not, we're not conducting our business correctly. Those are issues that uh, don't require a second, they can be made by a member, and it's up to the chair um, to determine. There's no vote on those issues. Um, <clears throat> incidental motions um, are motions that um, would come up in connection with another issue that's going on. Um, so one incidental motion would be a, appeal a ruling by the chair. If the chairperson makes a ruling, a ruling and um, the members of council want to overrule that ruling, um, they would do it by appealing that, that motion. Uh, or I'm sorry, appeal, uh, appealing that decision. Um, and a point of order is something that can be brought up where again, the rules aren't being followed um, on some particular matter, a member can raise that issue. Um, a point of information allows a member to request information on a particular issue. Um, that's one of the business items. Um, <clears throat> you, you have a, a motion to withdraw or modify a motion. Um, and this would be made by a council member who, once the issue is being debated, has determined that they no longer wish to have their motion pending or um, they wish to change their motion in some respect. It's important to note that under our rules of council, that can only, a motion can only be withdrawn if the person who seconded that motion um, also agrees that it can be withdrawn. So that's a little bit of a deviation from Robert's rules as well. Um, a motion for division of the assembly um, would be in an instance where there is a voice vote on an item and someone from council wants to have the votes counted individually um, to ascertain what everyone's vote was with clarity. Um, division of a motion would, require, would allow a motion that has multiple parts to be broken down into its individual um, sections and questions. Um, and then there is also um, an objection that can be made, um, object to consideration of a motion altogether. Um, and this would avoid the motion. Um, this is not debatable. Uh, it does not require a second, but it would require two thirds of a vote and it would kill a motion that was on the floor. And a lot of these ones that I'm talking about now are not common motions at all. Um, they do get a little bit into the weeds of parliamentary procedure, but I want the council to be aware of. It's hard to kind of only teach part of it. You kind of have to address all of them um, in order to be thorough and complete. And then finally, there are special motions. Um, and these are really considered main motions, but there is something special about them. Um, usually it's because it's going to be addressing um, something that's been previously brought up. So um, like, I meant, like I said earlier, if there's a motion to table something, it requires a motion to take it off the table. So one of the special motions would be to take something from the table and allow it to be um, brought back up before the body. Um, to reconsider a motion would be to address something that's already been decided um, by the body. 
but that mo that motion can only be made by the member who voted with the a, a member who voted with the prevailing vote. So it has to be somebody who voted a certain way and then after further consideration wants to reconsider that vote. Um, to repeal would annul a previously adopted motion. Um, it would require two thirds of a vote um, if no notice has been given of the intent to make this motion. If notice has been given, it only requires a majority. And uh, to discharge a committee means to remove an item from a committee's hands before its report is given. Um, if no previous notice has been given of the motion, it requires two thirds vote, otherwise it requires a majority. And so all of these little charts I think are kind of handy in going through these. Um, we are going to uh, strive to follow these rules. Uh, obviously they're very important because um, the reason we have them is to make sure that the voice of the minority and the majority are both heard and heard fairly um, and that, that motions are properly considered, um, amended, changed, postponed, tabled, whatever needs to happen, um, that we're all kind of working off the same set of rules. So I don't have much more in terms of discussion. I, I would recommend that everyone kind of go through it. Let me know if you have questions. Um, I'm happy to speak with you individually if there are questions about it, but moving forward, um, I would recommend that we, we try to stick to following Robert's rules when we don't have um, when we don't have a specific rule on an issue for city council, are there any questions now? Uh, Emily, I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use a hypothetical that's not actually going to occur. Uh, the city of Wyoming creates a spaceship, let's say, that's not going to happen. But if it does. We have a disagreement within council about whether to spend money to create a spaceship. Mm -hmm. Another party in this nine member uh, group uh, disagrees and says we should not build a spaceship. Which of these motions is going to be critical in that disagreement about a particular uh, finite um, activity? We have a particular finite activity Someone is proposing it, someone else on council is opposing it. Mm -hmm. Which of these motions would be most likely to be used in that kind of context, please? Okay, so let's, let's walk through that a little bit. So obviously the motion to build the spaceship would be a main motion. Um, and, and there's some debate on this issue. Um, so, so there could be subsidiary motions made with respect to this decision. It might be um, that Council wants more information about what they're paying for. Um, so, but they do want to consider it again at a later date. So that would be a motion to postpone to a definite time until that information can be obtained. Um, it could be that someone wants to buy a spaceship, but also thinks in doing so, we should pay for training for the astronauts. So it may be a motion to amend uh, the motion to include the astronaut training in the total cost of the spaceship. Um, I mean, I think when you walk through these, um, you'll see that, uh, that there's, there's lots of things that can happen to that main motion, depending on the will of the council members. Okay. Now, now it could be that we have been talking about the rocket ship for an hour and a half. And so maybe there's a motion to close debate because it's time to vote. Okay. Um, so I, I think you, you can kind of see by looking at the chart, all the options that council would have. Okay. Well, I, in my hypothetical case, then, I move to withdraw the motion that's the main motion mm -hmm. regarding the spaceship. I move to withdraw that. So you, you made the motion. Be, it's, an incidental, it's an incidental motion and I would be under D, small d, moving to uh, withdraw that motion. Right, so if you made that motion and you wish to withdraw it, um, under the rules of council, whoever seconded that motion has to agree with you to withdraw it. Okay, looking at D, D, withdraw or modify, mm -hmm. the second sentence. Under the rules of council, 
a motion can may only be withdrawn without the consent of the member oh, who seconded. I, I apologize. That should be with the consent. I, I apologize. Yeah, that's with, what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Sure. Are there any other questions? Uh, just a quick one because we've run into this. So oh, if a main, main motion were introduced and seconded at that point, can you still move to amend or want you can? Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. The main motion, if you look at the first table with the rankings, where um, that, that explains the subsidiary motions and they're ranked one through seven, the main motion would actually be number eight. So any of those items above the main motion could be used to, to deal with the, the main motion. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And coming back to my spaceship hypothetical, if I may, to postpone indefinitely, instead of having a vote on the spaceship, I would be moving to postpone duration of the spaceship indefinitely. And I would then need a majority of the members of council to agree to that. Is that correct? That's correct. No. Emily? Yeah. Could you scroll down more towards the bottom? Sure. Just a little bit more, I think. Yeah, so um sorry if there's a motion that um is not your typical approve this report city council matter maybe it's it's uh, a motion that's gonna pit sorry my dogs are hungry. if it's a motion that maybe is designed to sort of pit council members against each other and instead of just having to vote or abstain, you could, I guess, do this object to consideration of motion if you were you one could. of those members. You could. I can tell you I've never actually seen this motion made in real life, but it is it is part of Robert's rules. You could object uh, to the consideration of the motion. It uh -huh. does not require a second. It is not debatable and it is not amendable. Um, council would simply vote on that objection and it would require two thirds of council members to agree that that motion is not going to be considered. Okay, great, thank you. So like I said, if once you kind of can, you know, wrap your mind around some of these concepts and if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I'm happy to um, discuss any of them, any of these items with you. Um, and we will, we will strive to make sure we are, we are following these rules going forward. Uh, one more question, if I may, mm -hmm. as chair of the law committee, I sometimes would have a legal aspect of something that buildings and grounds or equipment or somebody has, has done. How would my committee take charge or take a, a role in the consideration of a substantive decision by the city. Say the law committee has a point of view that differs from those that want to build the spaceship. How would that occur? So can city council could, I think I, I understand your question. City council could refer the specific issue to the committee um, and the committee would consider it and then report back to council. Is, is that the question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is a that is a subsidiary motion that can be made would be to refer it to committee um, and allow the committee to report back. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. If there are there any further questions? Well, we will now move on to a third item of business discussion of search firm.
Does anyone like to start first by discussing uh, the firms that we met with? I just, just yeah, before we start, I just want to confirm one thing. Um, Emily, this is correct. We don't need to go to executive session on this. That's correct. This would okay. not be appropriate for executive session. No, I just want to confirm that. Okay. Mayor, I, I, I'm very impressed with all the backgrounds of all the different search firms that we have. Um, worked with a lot of um, similar search firms in my professional career. Um, what really brings me, and, and I've thought a lot about this, is I, I feel like we shouldn't be going, we don't need to be going down this route. If we didn't have a clear um, successor to Lynn, if we really wanted to find somebody different, then that'd be one area. But what Rusty has shown over the last couple of months for me personally is a level of professionalism. Uh, we are lucky to have someone like him. Um, obviously, I feel very strongly in what a job Lynn did. And one of the things that she did was she had secession planning. She had a bench that was behind her. So in a time that we have right now where we're limited on our funds and everything we have, spending the, the money on an executive search firm to go out there and tell us that we already have a not just tremendous candidate, but somebody that's been part of the city, I really have some reservations on, on spending the taxpayer's money on a search firm when we have such a fantastic candidate in front of us. Thank you. Uh, who'd like to be heard next? I think actually for similar reasons, I've come to the opposite conclusion. So I think that's interesting. Uh, one of the things Lynn said to me before she left was that she strongly encouraged counsel to consider a search firm, even if there were a strong internal candidate, because including the community, hearing from all the members of the community about what they think we need moving forward, not only would inform that search, but if in the end we did end up hiring an internal candidate, that would give that hire more credibility. So to me, there's one point in that favor, thanks to Lynn's good advice. Um, I also think given the meeting, the, the way we started the meeting, thinking about how to broaden our net, it would be pretty hypocritical if we didn't broaden our net to start with here. We may end up still catching the fish, that we have in front of us. But um, I think there's just, there just an important point to be made in that process. And I also think what we've heard from the finance department and the projections we're getting right now, I feel less concerned about spending this sum of money right now than I would have been six months ago. So I, I, I also feel like we're in a good place. And even given the interest of people who came tonight just to hear us talk about this, I imagine there are 8,000 other people in town who also want their opinions to be heard. And I'd rather us go through it in a systematic process. So Sarah, which, uh, which uh, saying that, which search firm did you, did you have any preference on which search firm? Yeah, and so two of them impressed me. I wanted to hear what the rest of you think. Um, management partners was, their price was pretty good. They had some add-ons and I would want to add on the community input, but he mentioned kind of gathering that information and thinking about the sort of candidate that you need for your community where it is now. So the goal being find your best candidates, but no, for instance, we need a healer right now, and that's the example he gave, then that's the highly qualified type of person you look for. Um, and then also the um, Novak Consulting Group also very much impressed me. Both of them talked about um, searching in diverse ways, but also have systems in place to make sure that we're hearing from community members. And I also think for council, after the year that we had working on this together and doing it in a thoughtful way will also be a, a good process for us to go through, which is what we've heard from the school board with their search. So those two are at the top of my list, but I, I'm curious what else the rest of you think. 
Could we have a clarification, please? Go ahead, Jim. Okay. I'd like a clarification of which aspect of the city's financial position makes you feel that there is additional money to be spent on this. There may be reasonable people who say you don't have enough money coming in and you're unlikely to have enough money in 2021 to, to fund this. Others might say, oh, we've got plenty of it. Is there a factual basis for concluding that there is sufficient money to have a broad ranging uh, interaction? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I can, in the next few minutes, pull up the last finance um, committee report. But I will say that given the cuts that the city made last year, we ended up being in a pretty secure position. And the last report that we heard projected that we, we will be stable moving forward unless there are any sort of you know, looming surprises within the, the national economy. But it, um, barring that, we appear to be stable. So if someone else wants to jump in with their opinion on the firms, I can pull up the last finance committee report and pull up numbers for you if that would help. It would help, like yes, to, thank you. Okay. Who'd like to be heard next on, on hiring a consultant? Nancy, please. Um, yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, first of all, being that um, I think the school district is a fantastic example to look toward. They did an executive firm search and they, um, well, sorry, let me back up. I think Rusty's doing a fantastic job. I um, have nothing but good things to say about him, um, but I would really, find I was not being a responsible council member if I just simply hired him to save us $25,000 when whoever we hire for this position is, you know, if they follow Lynn's lead could be leading our city for the next decade. Um, I don't want to skimp on that um, because we are not an impoverished community and we will bounce back from whatever um, issues we've had with the pandemic. We are very lucky and fortunate in that way. But I think our citizens have high expectations of um, in their own work life, um, as we've seen from Scott Sparrow. I mean, they're used to um, going about these things in a very professional way. And um, I think the school district gives a great example of how they went out and did an executive search and they came back with a fantastic candidate that people love and who really is aligned with their goals. And I know from speaking with several school board um, members that part of the process of just doing a search rather than just saying, oh, we'll just pick the inside candidate is that it forced them to clarify among themselves as a group, you know, what did they think, what do they think are the important leadership qualities within um, in our case, a superintendent, but for us, a city manager, um, to find out, you know, in our case, what what the staff think, um, definitely what our citizens think. Um, I, I would feel really irresponsible if I didn't give um, the people that I represent, um, which is, you know, the whole city, so a chance to voice their thoughts on what they want and really to have them think about, you know, what, what their vision is for our city. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I, I, I think Rusty's great. And if he's the best candidate and if that's what we decide, um, wonderful, but to not go through the process to save a few dollars now, I, I, um, I think that's short-sighted. Um, sorry, I'll stop babbling about this and just say that um, I sent a spreadsheet out to everyone on council um, I think one member of council may have shared it with the community, but that's fine. Um, but because I think it's hard to compare apples to apples with these presentations, some of these uh, firms, for instance, uh, I think it was, is that the one you liked, management partners? Um, I think their costs I, could be higher than that 19,000 figure. Um, I really think most of them are coming in around like 23, 24, 25,000. 
uh, except for the one that's way up at 36. Um, but when I looked through them, I, I, I mean, I thought Management Partners was good. One thing I liked about Novak is that they were very um, specific in the types, in the ways that they would conduct their search. They gave specific social media platforms that they would um, use. So I, I like that they weren't sort of vague about, um, you know, some of the others sort of used just more jargony language, but didn't get into some of the, the nitty gritty. I, I like that. I felt it was very thorough and comprehensive. I thought their presentation was very professional. Um, yeah, so I think uh, they would be my top choice. I'm sorry, management partners or Novak, your top Novak. choice? Novak. Who would like to go next? You want to go, Jeff? Sure, Mr. Mayor, I'll go. <clears throat> Excuse me. A uh, couple thoughts. First of all, with result, talking about the the agencies, I I thought uh, management partners had the lowest price, but if you look, they have a lot of extras, and and if you conclude the extras, which are actually mandatories, like I think they have advertising as an extra, that puts them right in the ballpark and the sweet spot of the other firms for the most part. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be swayed by the price. My my favorite of the four was Novak. Um, I thought Nancy did a good job covering it. What for me, listening to the four of them, I kind of looked at that as a job interview, Mr. Mayor, and I was surprised at what I would say were the lack of rehearsals and preparation. And the ones that had two people, they were talking over each other. They didn't know who was going to go first. So you go ahead. And I would have thought coming in, if you're trying to pitch me for business, you would be polished and rehearsed. And I would know Jeff's going to take this and Nancy's going to take that. And I didn't see that with the exception of Novak. I, I would use the word polish and I was kind of disappointed in the other. So that, that impressed me. Um, they also talked about community forum and a community survey, which uh, I think is included in their price, but I like the idea of the community survey. So Novak is my front runner. Do you have a number two? Sir? Did you say you have a number two? No, I don't have a number two. I would say Novak would be my choice. If, if they're eliminated for whatever reason, I'd have to relook at the data. I would want to add one thing though, and, and I, I don't close with a question for another member of council based on something that was said in this discussion. Uh, I, I think Rusty has done a fantastic job. Uh, he would be my front runner at this point, without a doubt. I'd have to see what the other candidates were. I think the communication he's done, I, I assume he's doing with everybody what he's doing with me is I get a phone call every week checking on whether or not I read the newsletter and if I have any questions. And, and I always make sure I ask him how many people use the rec center because that's no longer in the newsletter and it was very important to me. I'm kidding. Um, but I, I think it was a seamless transition from Lynn to Rusty. I think that's really important to notice. And, you know, I think in a leadership position, the culture fit, the culture fit is so important, not only with the employees, but with the community, because if you make a bad decision, and have somebody who is toxic in their leadership style, it would take us another six months with an executive search agency going through the process all over again. And, and that's in the back of my mind. I'm not saying it's not the right process. I'm saying that's in the back of my mind when we come to making a decision that we have to make sure we make the right decision because I really don't think we, we get a second chance without some serious damage. Having said that, I said I had a question for a member of council and Zach kicked it off by saying he thought Rusty was the best choice and we shouldn't do this. And I was curious, I, I named a couple of things I thought from what I've seen working with Rusty. I was curious, Zach, if you could elaborate on what some of the reasons why you thought he had done such a great job and what would make you say that right now that there was no need to look further. I think one of the things we talked originally was about communication as one of our gaps and his level of communication, I think has been exceptional. Um, I'm really not that concerned with the money. I mean, that's certainly a, an issue that I don't want to spend taxpayer money that we don't need to. But the biggest issue is we had a secession plan before Lynn left. We have a bench of people that were being trained for this position. And to throw that away, and again, spending that extra money and that extra time and search just to make sure that we've got the right candidate, when the right candidate is part of our uh process that Lynn put together over the last couple of years that knows the city's backwards and forwards can hit the ground running and is somebody that is really shown to be a uh, you know a, a bridge builder and so for me that that's all I need I don't need to go outside of the organization when our manager has done a great job building a deck and building and training and having those other people up 
rather than spending six months to go through a search firm, another one to two years to get that person probably up to the speed that they would need to be. And we've got the, I think the, the, the perfect candidate looking at us right now. Thank, thanks for that. And uh, I appreciate that. I'm curious to hear what Al and Jim and you, Mr. Mayor, have to say too. Thank you. All right, Jim, do you want to share your views with the, with the group, please? Sure. This is my third city manager search in 20 years. So I've got some background on the good and the bad and the ugly. My learning from the past experiences is that we should have a good sense as a council of what makes for a successful interaction with the city staff. We can each say, oh, I like this at the rec center or I like this at the pool or whatever, but the ability of that individual to work with the city staff and then come to us and say, I want your support for growing this department or changing this function is very important. I believe we're in Kansas City for the National League of Cities meeting, I believe, uh, when we had our discussion about um, hiring a person who uh, Bob was very talented, of course, but we had to consider how would Bob get along with the staff of the people who reported to him, and then how would he interface? Interface is a buzzword, of course, but how would he interface? I think we need to learn from other cities about the interfacing, what's worked well, so that we don't simply say, that guy, that woman is terrific. We have to say, their talents for interacting with their staff will meld with the staff that we have. We don't want to lose an excellent police chief, an excellent fire chief, etc. We want to have that skill set that will meld the staff organizations that we've got, build upon that, and then work with council. So that's my experience based on those 20 years. Okay, based on that, would you are you interested in uh, retaining a consultant? And if so, which consultants are you most interested in retaining? If we were to have a consultant, I think Dave Krings' presentation uh, and that, if, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the group, but I think Krings' uh, group was uh, most impressive to me. Can I just say something real quickly, uh, Thad? Yeah. I, I just want to be clear that I don't, uh, I don't want to spend city money. Um, I, I, I want to spend city money on um, really good quality of life things for our citizens. Um, I, I don't think, um, I don't want it implied by other members of council that, that any of us are not good stewards of the city's money. Um, it's just my opinion that um, some things are worth investing in. Yes. Um, which, which one is Dave Krings? That's management partners, Mayor. Oh, management partners. Management oh, okay. Partners. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> and uh, can we hear from Jeff a second? Or just was that just your first? Is that the only one? Jim, did you have a second pick or was it just management partners? If we were to have a an advising firm, I think um, I've known Jerry Newfarmer for 20, 30 years, uh, but uh, management partners seem to me to be the most um, detail oriented in the work that needs to be done uh, here locally. So you just have one one pick, just one person, just one group? That would be my choice, yes. Okay, all right. Um, Al? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I'm, in my opinion, the transition between um, between Lynn Tetley and, and where we are now with Rusty has been fantastic. I think when uh, I had a real opportunity to work with Lynn and I also had an opportunity to work with uh, Bob Harrison. And uh, one thing that I did realize, um, so sit back folks, it's gonna be a long story. Uh, one of the things that I, one of the things that I did realize is I had an opportunity to work with Bob Harrison, who really, to the day he left, really had no understanding or concept of what Wyoming was about. Uh, and with and but the best thing that he did was that he trained 
uh, Lynn Tetley and had Lynn Tetley as a backup who uh, had all of the skills and the abilities to be a city manager, but at that time, it was not her time. But when the time came, uh, city council went through a, an extensive search and used a slave and management company to, uh, to search very wide and very far. And we had uh, candidates come from all over the United States and Lynn Tetley. And during that entire process, Lynn Tetley continued to come forward and, con and was in the position of an acting city manager. So the opportunities that she had was to show her skills of being the, and being a, a city manager and, and having an understanding of what the city was about and also having a tremendous understanding about the employees and the, uh, the staff that she was working with. So out of that benefit, everybody here knows Lynn Tetley and knows about her extensive collaboration. One of the last things that Lynn Tetley did say to me was that she had been work, uh, she had uh, mentored uh, Rusty Hersog to become city manager, and that was her choice. And if she was to choose today, she would have chosen uh, Rusty Hersog as be the city manager, and that he had the knowledge to be able to move forward without any transition hiccups. He understood the community, he understood the staff, and he also had the ability as to move sideways. And what I mean by that, he had the ability to listen to what you have to say, to have establish an understanding of what you want, and then be able to move to, get, to achieve that. I think that's what he's done. So a long story to a short question is, I'm in favor of, of Rusty Herzog and for us not to move forward uh, with uh, having to look into a company. Now you're gonna ask me the question, which company? So the company that I, I had two companies, one was management partnership and the other one was Novak if I had to, if I had to go in that direction. And I'll be honest with you, uh, both of those were pretty much a tie for me. One of them, um, I think the basic fundamental when I looked at all of the consultant companies was the core was the same. And the, then what happened after that was the menu driven piece where you could select this, but you were going to pay for it. And that's, and I think that's the difference between the each individual company. Okay. All right. And just Go ahead. To clarify. My first choice is no search firm. My second choice would be management consultants. The big things form. Okay. Sarah, did you? When you gave me yours, you said management partners, then Novak. Is that the order you want it? They're kind of tied for me. So you got to untie them for me, please. No, you're, you're not going to be the tiebreaker. <laughs> no, well, I think that's going to be the problem. So that, that's why I wanted you to untie them, because I think that might be an issue. But you don't want to be the one who makes the decision. No, I don't mind. I just think, I just think right. if you say that, well, maybe it won't matter. Maybe it won't matter. Never mind, never mind. You can hold it. You can hold it. It doesn't matter. Okay. I, I can keep saying it. Yeah, I think you're Mr. Saying. Mr. Mayor, yep. can I can I clarify one th thing? Sure. I'm looking through the notes here. Mr. Krings, who uh, Mr. O'Reilly was commenting was his first choice is with Slavin. Slavin. Oh. It's not, it's not management partners. Mr. King. I stand corrected. Mr. Krings is with uh, with uh, Slavin management. Slavin management. All right. I'll change my corrected. vote to Slavin and also then. All right. Now this is Mr. Mayor. Can I ask uh, the Vice Mayor a question? Yes. Hey Al, when when <clears throat> excuse me when you did the search last time, yep. and you had Lynn there in the in the works on deck, and you still did the search, uh, was there discussion before going down that path to just go ahead and hire Lynn? And if if there was, why was the decision still made to use the search firm? Do you remember by any chance? I think what I think uh, part of the reason, and Jim can correct me on this, part of the reason was the same reason that you consider a search firm here. No. Uh, and that is you have the best candidate sitting in front of you and you want to say, I have the best candidate sitting in front of me. So you go out and you, so you, so you, so you go out and you establish a search company to, to prove that for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's, 
that's part of the part of the I know that was the reasoning for it. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, so you have to ask yourself, in my opinion, you have to ask yourself at this point is the person that you have, uh, is that a candidate? And is that person not only a candidate, but is that the best person that you could have? And uh, in my mind, and only in my mind, uh, Rusty is, is in, in my opinion, the best person. I think he has some real opportunities. And I think anybody that comes into this position has some real opportunities. And those opportunities are obviously the diversity component piece um, that can be, uh, the city needs to work on. And he has that understanding because he's been a part of that process from the beginning. So he understands the, the need and the drive to have diversity and culture be a part of what Wyoming is about and to be brought forward and for people to understand how we can become together and unify together. And I think that's, that's a characteristic that he has. So that's a long question to, uh, uh, I apologize for- No, that was, on. that was good. And you know, um, I would be open to the no search firm. I guess my question is what I'm, what I'm trying to reflect on is, you know what, I apologize, Rusty, I know you're in the room, but it goes with the territory. Like what, what qualities would I be looking for in a candidate that Rusty does not possess? That's, that's the question I find myself asking. If you ask the question of me, uh, if you ask the question of me, you have two, in my opinion, you have a person that you've had an opportunity to work with for four years or longer than that, or two years. So you take that individual's person and you take the characteristics of that person which is the same exact thing that the school district did and said, A, I love this characteristic. B, I don't want this characteristic. B, I like this characteristic. C, I want it to be a different characteristic. So you do, a, so what you do is a positive and negative whenever you begin to look at the, the city manager that you want. And in my opinion, we had the city manager who we wanted, who was Lynn Tetley. Now, each one of us have our own little things about Lynn Tetley, but when you look at for the community and city council and moving forward and being able to handle the issues that are brought to this position, she had, a, she had all of those abilities. That's very different than what the school district had. The school district did not have the characteristics that they wanted to be able to move the school district forward to another level of understanding and operations. So what they did is when they went through their list, they went through more negatives than they did positives. So they had to hire a consultant company because they didn't have the positives, nor did they have a mentor that had the same character, nor did they have a person mentored with the same characteristics of what they wanted. So they had to go out, establish the characteristics of what they wanted in a school district superintendent, and then begin to hire a company to look for that and then hopefully have the ability to match those up. And that's what they did. So, uh, but when you, and did they, they went as far north and as far south and as far east and as far west. What did they end up with a guy from Madeira? <laughs> so, no. no, that was really good. And, you, and Mr. Mayor, I have is, to say- Who is exceptional, by the way. Yes. Yes. And Mr. Mayor, I have to say, we've all shown our cards except for you. So I'm really curious for your thoughts. You can't get off the hook, sir. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my statement. I just want to make sure I'm clearing everybody. And, uh, and so, Jim, you didn't say yes or no on the consultant. Well, I very much appreciate how Lynn prepared Rusty so very well. I think Rusty would be a terrific city manager. Over these 20 years, as I look at the comparators, he's got all the strengths. But if we were to go and seek out the, the broadest uh, set of things, um, I think that the, um, well, I'm more inclined to go with Rusty, uh, but if we were to go outside, I think that the Kring's presentation 
was the most impressive one for me. We're going to go if the majority of council wants to go. Okay. Then I would vote to stay with Rusty. Well, it's not, that, it's not about staying with Rusty. It's about whether or not you want to get a consultant. That's, yes, the, okay. that's the question I'm asking. Okay. Um, at this point, no. Okay. Okay. So as I do the math, I see three people who want a consultant, three people who don't want a consultant. Uh, I want a consultant. So I will be the, tiding, the deciding vote here. It'll be four, three. I want a consultant. This has nothing to do with Rusty. I think Rusty is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It would have who we had in the position. I think the, for me, personally speaking, it's the process. And I want people in the city of Wyoming to buy into the process and to believe that the process is fair, that anybody can apply, regardless, regardless if you have the position before, regardless if you're already, you're already a city employee. And you know, and I understand there's finite amount of resource. And I understand this is taxpayer dollar money. And I try to treat taxpayer dollar money like it's my own money. I know this can be taken away from something, some other project. I, I get that. I understand that. But to me, this position is very important. And I want the residents to believe that the process and how it, we arrive at the decision, because I do think ultimately we're going to arrive at the decision that most of the people have already stated tonight, but I don't want to prejudice it. But nonetheless, I want people to see it as a fair process, one that is open to everyone, regardless of their background, regardless of their uh, connections with the city. So I am going to, I will vote for a, a consultant. With that said, the consultant, now I say that, and I say, I try to treat the city's money like my own money. I think I'm safe when I do that, treat the city's money like my own money. And the way I would treat my money, I would try to get as, spend as least amount of my money as possible. All right, as least of my, so when I say that for me, my perspective, I don't want extras on anything, all right? I don't want anything extra. With that said, I was most impressed by Novak. I thought the pres present presentation was tight. I liked the way she talked about, she really uh, hit on diversity and inclusion. That was important to me. She has experience uh, in the state of Ohio. She talked about Centerville, which is sort of a, a, a city that's comparable size to Wyoming. So that would be my first choice. And as I've done the math, that would give Novak three votes and management partners uh, two votes and, and Slavin two votes. Unless people want to change their pick on who they want to be the consultant, I think I would say uh, Novak would be uh, uh, the selection. And I'm open to hear what other people want to say. Um, I, I like Novak quite a bit. Oh, I don't know if I'm doing feedback. So um, I'm happy to support that. And I agree with you. I, I want to make this as democratic a process as we can and it's open to the community. One of the like, life lessons I've gotten with Rusty in this role is there are so many things I didn't understand that I can benefit from with having someone like him in this position. So there may be other things we don't yet know about what the community wants in a city manager. So um, I, I'm happy to support them. I, I, I do understand the um, financial implications of this. And I'm sorry, at the, it's so hard to find the finance, um, finance committee notes on the website. I couldn't find them, Jim. I do know that the last income tax receipts that we had were down a bit, but not as catastrophically down as we thought they were. So, I mean, and if Jeremiah Siri wants to correct me and he thinks he cannot afford this, please let me know. But I think that this amount of money will not break us. Emily, do we, do we have to do a motion on this at all since we're talking all about these motions? So a, a couple things here. Um, one is that in committee of the whole meetings, council really doesn't take any formal action. Okay. Uh, it just has discussion. A second item is under the charter, the city manager is charged with entering into all contracts on behalf of the city. So, uh, and in, when there's a vacancy in the office of city manager, it's the acting city manager who gets that job. So I think leaving this meeting tonight, 
uh, Rusty has gotten the direction that council wants to take with respect to uh, the manager search. Um, we can have Rusty reach out to, I guess, Novak um, and ask for a contract and I can review that with him um, and we can go ahead and get the ball, roll ball rolling on that unless there is an objection by any council members to that process. Are the or, is or. the public allowed to say anything yet? I'll open up to public comment. Okay. If if uh, if the public is going to speak, we'd ask that you uh, to help with the minutes. We ask that you give your name and address before speaking. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Kaplan. I live at one fifteen Burns. Um, as a very successful businessman that's been through this process before many a time. I don't think this is a good decision. When you have something that's working already, there's no need. When you have employees doing a great job, there's no need to spend $25,000 to get a new guy that you, you don't know if it's gonna work out or not. It's preposterous. And paying the huge taxes we pay here, as the public, we don't wanna pay a bunch of extra money for this. This is ridiculous. And all the diversity and inclusion stuff, we just want the best candidate. We already have it. We know you've been, you've been trained, you know what you're doing. And I just don't see this as a useful thing. And I'm, I'm sad. I don't think you've ever had a real job. I mean, you, what money do you have? I mean, you, you shouldn't be telling people what to do with the, the money. You're wasting money. It's, it's not the right decision. Maybe you should come talk to me and I'll explain to you how business works because you obviously don't know what you're doing. So, you, want, you know, come over here, Thad, and let's talk because you, you, you really don't have a clue. You just don't. So, I, I get it. Okay? So, I would, so I, I, would just, I would just ask that we keep the comments uh, as positive as possible uh, moving forward. Thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, JT, JT, go ahead. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm Joel. I live at 1256 Garden Circle. Um, I've, I work on my own vehicle, so I'm going to use this as a, a little analogy here. I have a Jeep. I know I can fix it. I know it works. I'm not looking for a Ferrari. So what we have here is a situation where we have a Toyota. It gets the job done. It lasts a very, very long time. But people are wanting to literally waste money to get a Ferrari. And that's a lot higher maintenance. So I don't know if anybody understood that, but come on. I mean, I just heard the mayor say, we have a great candidate. It'll probably come down to him, but I want to waste money. That's what I heard. I'm not trying to attack anybody with that, but it's foolish. On top of that, everyone's talking about diversity and inclusion. Come on, people. What did, I, I second, we are looking for the right candidate. If we have the right candidate, we need that person. We don't need to be searching far and wide to the hinterlands only to end up with that person or worse. Because let's face it, people are going to put on airs when they come here. And it depends upon how much you pay them and what the benefits are and where they're at. And as far as the school goes, I've, I've spoken with the guy that they got, and I'm not impressed. I'll say that just right off the bat. Okay. So not all these decisions that they're making are good. <laughs> I mean, you're, 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 we have people right here in our own community now. For me, it's the fiber of the community that counts. If you have someone that's from here, grew up from here, worked here, they know what it's about. That person is invested here and they want to keep it a nice community. And the diversity and inclusion, that's a straw man argument anyway. I mean, think about it. Look, I'm a man of color. There's only 13% of us in America and I'm being generous. It's probably 11 or 12. Of that 13%, nine or 10 are of working age. And of that nine or 10%, well, guess what? Maybe six or 7% have the qualifications you're looking for. So I did appreciate that production. You put a lot of thought of it into, not, into it tonight, but it's a straw man argument. You're not going to get the numbers you're wanting to. There's no hard set percentage that you could get. We have the people here already. I know there's people rolling their eyes right now. and going, oh my God, he's every kind of bigot and ist on the face of the earth. But I don't get, we have the people here. We have our, our, our pool that we need here, you know? So that's, I know it was long-winded, but I got to go with Rusty. I mean, there's, there's no sense in spending money. There, it's just not. 
it's dependable, reliable, been here forever. It is what it is. I mean, I'm not looking forward for anybody else. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. If you don't have your video on, if you could raise your virtual hand and I'll call on you with their raising your virtual hand. Phil, since I can see you, go ahead and uh, we'll start with your name and your address. Sure. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Phil Jardina. I'm at 367 Ashley Lane. Um, a little bit of background. Um, my experience at Proctor, 33 years, uh, the last 10 were in HR, but importantly, before even way before that, in the first 25, I was a campus recruiter and went to several campuses. And as part of my interviewing for candidates and learning about what it takes to interview and find candidates, I also did that in South America while we were th down there for three years. I share that just to let you know that I'm not talking from, from a position of just emotion. Okay, so the f former gentleman uh, made a very clear point about the importance of being in touch with the local culture and understanding the heartbeat of the city. Um, how are you going to engage with people when issues arise depend enormously on your ability to listen on your ability to communicate and your ability to understand likely where these folks are coming from, sometimes by intuition. And you don't get that from somebody that comes from Neverland. Um, another point I wanted to make was that uh, at this moment, actually, uh, I happen to be president of the golf club. And last year, uh, and we are continuing to live with, uh, we faced a situation where uh, just before, in fact, the start of the pandemic, our general manager left um, for another job. And we had to decide what we were going to do because, frankly, uh, we didn't have a lot of extra cash. And through this year, obviously, we didn't generate a whole lot of extra cash. So the subject of trying to hire a new general manager at $50,000 or whatever it was going to be to bring one in uh, didn't suggest that we didn't have a search committee. We did among ourselves. Um, and we actually interviewed a few candidates. But in the end, while all this was going on in the background, we realized that we couldn't just continue to operate um, kind of ad hoc. Um, and so what we decided to do was to appoint one of our department heads as the general manager. And that turned out to be about the most brilliant idea that ever hit the deck in the last 18 months. Talk about a fellow who not only could do the job, okay, but who had skills we didn't even know about, okay, at the moment. We hired him to be our head chef. Turns out he's our IT support. Turns out he's a team leader. He stepped up in a total team building fashion to bring all the other department heads together. You know, and, and one of the beautiful things about it is he's grown into the job. You know, when you put when you put the tiara on the on Caesar's head, you know, you hope that you hope that Caesar's going to get smarter. You know, and uh, when that happens, you put it. You'd be surprised when you actually get to sit on top. You know, and you realize what you have to do every day to make the whole thing run, not just your little area. How well that works, and I can tell you, um, I certainly have no complaints, and I think we had the best run small town police force probably in America um, under Rusty's leadership. And the things that made that true for me were all the elements of culture, understanding, reaching out, communication, uh, things you've mentioned. And, you know, I, there was a, a meeting I sat in on about 10 months ago, and I made a passing comment that said, folks, it looks to me like this is a solution in search of a problem. And Honestly, what I think you're doing tonight, and I appreciate the, the political cover, you know, you can hide behind a process, you know, but I've got to believe that, you know, intelligent people on our council can certainly go out and verbally talk to their constituents, their neighbors, their friends, in public meetings, in letters to the editor, and whatever they want to do, and let people know what a smart choice it was to keep Rusty as our, as our uh, city manager. Because if you can't communicate, if you can't communicate, why hide behind the process? 
It makes no sense to me at all. I said, if, you know, the fellow said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's all I have to say. Right. Thank, Thank you very you much. Bill. If there's anybody else that wants to speak, please raise your digital hand. Uh, we'll go with uh, Mr. Bartlett. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Chris Bartlett here, 1131 Brayton, past graduate, youngest graduate, Citizens Police Patrol, Wyoming. Uh, so I have a little bit of um, a background with the community, just dad, a past city, city councilman. My brother, I think, does a little bit of help with the, the services, but when, when it's all said and done, I, I want to take a second. All you guys that are serving, so our city council, the employees, I applaud you guys, every single one of you, for the job you've done this past year. Uh, you know, I, it, it's been an incredible year for, for all of us, uh, but especially, you know, serving in, in, in the different roles, uh, you know, being employed in a, in a public fashion. I, I mean, I, I just uh, hats off to all of you. Again, um, I want to start with that. The, the, the second thing is, I, I, I am, um, you know, I'm in total favor of supporting Rusty. Uh, he has done an incredible job and uh, this city, this community needs stability. I, I say that wholeheartedly uh, just looking around and go, going through the, uh, the daily news and um, the, 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 where we are is, is not just a community, but, but also in, in society. I, I can't stress that enough. Stability is really huge right now. Um, I, I respect everybody's decision. I respect all of your, your thoughts. Uh, if you do go through the process of doing a search form, uh, firm, congrats. Uh, I hope, uh, hope you have some, some success. But I'm just weighing in on uh, the one thing that I think this community has always been about. Uh, we've always been very stable. There's not been a lot of uh, yin and yang. Uh, this, this group uh, of city council has always done things methodically and with purpose. So I just I, I hope and, and I pray that you guys uh, find clarity in, 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 in the end result. Um, again, I, I endorse Rusty. I think you have a, a clear cut leader, someone that I see out in front. I got a nine year old and he helps her, you know, get across the street. Uh, he's front and center in all the community um, uh, events. Uh, he's been a part of this in grain and the, the, the staff of the city. When I talk to him, because I do pull over, I buy him donuts. I, I called the city the other day and told him at 730 in the morning, you guys did a heck of a job clearing the roads. I work for AAA. Uh, so again, all I can tell you is um, I really, really uh, think um, uh, the decision uh, I respect, but my endorsement for sure is Rusty because of the stability and his involvement in the community. That's really about it. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Do we have anybody else? Rusty wants to speak. Um, I have an iPhone that says they want to speak, but I don't know the name. So you need to give me your name and your address. Hi, this is Randy Kaplan, 115 Burns Avenue. I also wanted to endorse Rusty. I think he's been awesome in our community. I think Lynn has done a fabulous job with the way she's worked with him. And speaking as a former recruiter at Goldman Sachs, I think the search firm is a terrible idea. I don't think you're going to get quality candidates at $25,000. And I will echo what Phil said, which is you're, it would be hiding behind a process of going through a search firm rather than you know, part of being an elected official, managing a group of people, is having interview skills and knowing who the right people are for the right job. And I don't think you should be hiding behind a search firm in $25,000 so that if it goes south, you have sort of an escape hatch to talk about. And I also don't think we should be looking to the school board as a beacon for how this has been done well. That is all. Thank you. Rusty. 
this Tess? This is Tess. Yes. Hi. This is Tess. This is Tess Harper 17 Richie, and I just wanted to communicate that I am support of um, the mayor's recommendation to do an executive search. I do believe that we do have a strong internal candidate, but I do value the process and making sure that we've done justice to our community by allowing us to just make sure all our bases are covered, that we've got the right candidate in the role. And I think Krusty will make a very strong candidate to be considered. So I think the best candidate will win if we trust the process. And I just want to voice that I support. Thank you, Tess. Anybody else would like to speak? They need to raise their digital hand. Mr. Mayor, I have no other hands. All right, okay, let's move on to the miscellaneous section. We'll start with Zach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I appreciate it. Um, I wanna address a uh, rumor that's been going around on social media and perpetuated by other members of council. I'm a resident of the city of Wyoming. I live in the city of Wyoming. My family has purchased a vacation home in Hilton Head as a result of the pandemic. We've been down there almost eight times over the last 18 months. Uh, so we can quarantine ourselves in a, in a private area. Um, I have a, uh, uh, a property in Wyoming with a signed lease. I have utilities in my name and would just, um, again, if any other rumors continue to go out there about where my place of residence is, they can bring that up with me directly or through my attorney. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nancy? Just a burning question for Rusty. I see that you're wearing your suit jacket and tie, but I'm wondering if there are swim trunks that we're not seeing below. What? A bad joke for Rusty's video, which I um, <laughs> haven't seen. It's quite funny uh, promoting uh, the pool. And um, now my swim trunks aren't on right now, Nancy. <laughs> uh, those were on just when I'm playing in the snow. But okay. thank you, though. Very good. <laughs> Jeff? Uh, first of all, Mr. Mayor, great meeting. Uh, great running the meeting. Very well organized. Appreciate that. And also the civility of everybody, both council members and citizens. The only thing I have to add in miscellaneous, sir, is that uh, there's a new physical therapy office open in Wyoming. It's Dreyer Physical Therapy. I was going to the one in Kenwood, uh, recovering from my torn meniscus, and the physical therapist said, that one of the physical therapists said she was going to the new office, the new franchise in Wyoming, so that's where I now go. Uh, they opened February 1st. They had six patients the first week. I was two of them, mm -hmm. and uh, this week they have 38 patients scheduled. The majority are Wyoming residents that are either referred there from their physician or come in on a self-referral, and it's a growing business. Hillary there, the physical therapist, is fantastic. And it's a great new asset in our community is right across the street from La Rosa's in the same building as that doctor's office where the Coldwell Banker used to be, I think it is. So uh, I know that Rusty has gone by and welcomed them to the community. They had some questions for the police, but uh, there's two young ladies who work in there. They're doing a fantastic job for our community. And I encourage everybody to go out and, and uh, if you have a physical therapy need, there's a physical therapist right here in Wyoming. Thank you, sir. Uh, Jim? Uh, no, I've, I've appreciated the uh, sincerity and depth of the issues, and uh, I'm pleased that we're going to move forward. I think the community will be well served by a constructive discussion and further constructive discussions. I want to point out, as I mentioned earlier, that to the extent we get involved in the, the selection process of lower ranked employees, we must take account of Ohio's collective bargaining law and the rights of the collective bargaining employees. Just want to say that for the record. Thank you. Sarah? Um, 
got it. I had in my notes that I also wanted to mention the pool video, but Nancy beat me to it. Um, kudos also to Brian Pittman for going into the pool full of snow. But above all, I cannot tell you how happy I am that the pool will be open. Um, and I've heard from so many people that it's like a sign that life is beginning to return back to normal. So thank you for making that announcement so fun and the if people have been hoped to cling on to. So thank you. Al? Um, you. You're on mute, Al. I think there it was, you. you didn't hear anything I said, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part. Uh, well, thank. I just wanted to thank you very much for all the work the city has done and, and keeping our streets and highways uh, clean and safe. Uh, I'm absolutely amazed at the process. It just continues to amaze me how, what a great job the folks do here. And again, thank you very much for your work, Rusty. Okay, uh, stay safe and look out for your neighbors. We're all here together, we live together, we've got to play together, work together. Okay, I do have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. This committee of the whole is adjourned.